Shouts of wire down, box full, and weigh him up filled in the Willamette Valley during hop harvest. To anyone who has worked in the hop fields, the cries are a nostalgic reminder. What part did hop agriculture play in the lives of Willamette Valley residents? Why did the industry decline? During the next half hour, we will recall and explore the history of hop agriculture in the central Willamette Valley. The hop plant is a twining perennial that produces small cone-like blossoms. Inside the mature hop cone is a yellow powder called lupulin. The lupulin contains the resins and oils for which hops are valued. Hops have been used as a vegetable, in bread, and as a medicine for many centuries. Today, hops are used almost exclusively in the brewing of beer and ales. The custom of adding hops to beer began about the 14th century. Hops retarded spoilage and added a slightly bitter taste as well as a distinctive aroma. Changes in the flavor of beer produced by hops were not always appreciated. In 16th century England, Henry VIII prohibited the use of hops in beer. It was only over the span of many years that hop production became an important business in England and elsewhere, and the taste of hops became firmly associated with beer. It is believed that hops were among the plants that pilgrims brought with them to North America in 1620. By 1800, hops were grown in a number of states, and New York became the center of U.S. hop production. As the nation expanded westward, so did the hop, and gradually the areas along the Pacific coast replaced New York as the major producers of American hops. It was common for many settlers' homes to have a hop vine growing near at hand to supply medicinal, bread-making, and home-brewing needs. The census of 1850 lists eight pounds of hops grown in the Oregon Territory. From that modest beginning, Oregon hop production grew steadily until Prohibition days, and for many decades the state was the leading U.S. hop producer. The rich soil and mild climate of the Willamette Valley made it well suited to the growing of hops. Hop culture began with the clearing of land and the working of soil in preparation for planting rootstock. Stakes were set out in a uniform pattern of rows. One or two cuttings were planted at each stake site and referred to as a hill. In the early days of the industry, poles about 10 feet tall, such as those in the background of this photograph, were set into the ground at each hill. About the turn of the century, some growers began using a post and wire system. Posts were set at every third or fourth hill, and wire, or twine, was strung from one post to another. String was then run between the stake at each hill and the overhead wire. The best of the young vines were trained to twine around the pole or string in a clockwise direction. Tall sleds pulled by horses or tractors enabled workers to reach the overhead wires and train the vines along them for maximum exposure to air and sunlight. Rosa Cole of Salem remembers training the vines. And by that time, we um, they had a high sled. And uh, my sister and I used to train on here. And we used to play games and sing songs and everything. While, as we drove along, we had this old horse. 
and she would pull this high sled while we trained. When we wanted her to go, we told her to go, and when she stopped, we told her to go. Mixtures of nicotine, or quasi-chips in whale oil soap, were effective pesticides used to control red spider mites and aphids. Harvest began sometime in August or early September, depending upon the variety of hop grown. Many farmers grew small acreages of hops that could be harvested by family members alone. Somewhat larger acreages required the help of near neighbors who would lend a hand at this critical time. But for many growers, harvest time meant hiring several hundred pickers to assist with the work. In major hop producing areas, the size and number of hop branches meant the influx of thousands of workers every harvest season. For example, Independence, known as the hop capital of the world, was a quiet town during most of the year. Harvest season, however, brought huge crowds, as many as 25,000 workers, most of whom arrived by train. Pickers were met at the depot by growers, who took them and their baggage to the hop ranches by wagon. Some arrived by steamboats, such as the Oregona. Still others arrived in their own wagons, on horseback, or on foot. Many workers returned year after year, brought their families and personal belongings, and stayed the whole season. In later years, they came by auto, bicycle, and bus. For most, hop harvest was a pleasant way to earn money for school and household expenses during the vacation. Rosa Cole, pictured here on the left, tells in a nutshell why she enjoyed harvest season. No, I liked hops. I liked work. I liked my paycheck. When cash was scarce, Hop picking was a way to provide necessities. Charles Staley remembers that income from harvesting hops was all he had in the way of cash. If we wanted to go to school and have some clothes and some school books, we picked hops, by guys. For some people, particularly during the Great Depression, hop picking was a way for a family to eke out an income in bad times. Accommodations at the farms varied. Pickers usually provided their own food and bedding, and sometimes their own tent and camp stove. On the larger farms, the grower provided cabins or tents as well as stoves, firewood, tables, benches, and straw for sleeping mats. Small stores were often available on both the large and smaller farms for the convenience of the pickers. Running the store on her family's hop ranch was how Beth Pervine Monroe made money for college expenses. I <coughs> ran a little store because these people didn't have any cars to get to town. Uh, they were brought to the campgrounds so often by their, their husbands or families and as I say, they were just there on a, a little outing for a, a while. They would have no way to uh, get their food, so I had a little store, probably uh, maybe 10 by 12 out of rough boards with a window that would open up in the front. On many ranches, Delivery trucks made regular runs from town to sell groceries to hop pickers. The working day began early. Everyone was in the field by 7 or 8 a.m. Most people wore old clothes or coveralls because hop stains were difficult to remove. Some wore hats for sun protection. 
Cotton or canvas gloves protected hands from the scratchy vines. In the early day pole yards, the picking began when the poles were hoisted out of the ground and lowered to rest against a support of crossed planks. In post and wire yards, the harvester picked the hops within easy reach and then hollered, wire down. At that call, the wire man came and used a pole with a hook at the end to lift down vines for stripping. A wire down pole is shown at the left of the photograph. Boxes were used in picking during the earliest days of the Willamette Valley hop industry. Later, canvas hoppers, such as those pictured here, were used. In some hop yards, bags hung from a metal framework were preferred. Later, baskets that held 50 pounds each were used. Pickers filled two baskets and shouted, weigh them up. The weigh man would then empty the hops into a sack to be weighed. The weight was entered in a book or punched on a ticket, and the picker received credit for a cent a pound or more, depending on the going rate. At the end of the day and on weekends, friendly wrestling matches, ball games, and dances filled any leisure time. The Key brothers, whose father rented a hop ranch in the Aurora area, recalled socializing in the evenings. Ming Key, pictured here on the left, describes the fun after supper. This photograph was taken by his brother, Bu. I still have an instrument, and they play, and they sing, you know, see, around the campfire, we built a huge campfire them days, you know, see, and we spend the evening until they're ready to go to bed, you know, there's a song, or stories, recitation, Rules were seldom posted. It was understood that decent behavior and clean picking were expected. Picking clean referred to picking hop cones only, avoiding leaves and stems. Yard bosses, or the growers themselves, kept an eye on the quality of the picking and would reject a basket of dirty hops. Indians had reputations as good, clean pickers. Some growers regularly recruited Indians from the Salettes, Grand Ronde, and Warm Springs reservations to harvest hops. Whole families would arrive in wagons and on horseback, and the ranches would furnish pasture in addition to the standard camping facilities. Children often accompanied their families to the field and helped with the picking. Sometimes they were rewarded with the pocket money they earned or with special treats. Sidney Newton of Independence recalls, That was something kids had to do to, as soon as you're big enough to go to the hop garden, you can do that pretty early. I was, I was six years old, I recall it. And so we go and pick hops and, and uh, we got awarded, I think, that we had to pick a box and a half of hops, and uh, we got the silly pop at the conclusion of the day. If we made there a lot, but, uh, we could even do that and play the rest of the time. While the amount a child could pick varied, an average adult worker could pick about 200 pounds of hops a day receiving punches on hop tickets for the amount picked. Each farm had different tickets. This hop money could be cashed in for payment from the grower or, in some instances, spent in town. Merchants would collect the value of the tickets from the hop growers at the end of the season. After picking, sacked 
crops were loaded into wagons and hauled to the drying kilns. Nearly all hop growers built their own kilns to dry the hops. Distinctive ventilators, or cupolas, marked the tops of the kilns. The drying floor of a kiln was about 16 feet above ground, and sloping platforms allowed hops to be carried up and dumped on the kiln floor. The floor of the kiln was not solid, but slatted and covered with burlap. This prevented the hops from falling through while permitting the free flow of heated air from stoves located underneath the drying floor. After 18 hours or so of slow drying, the kilns were emptied by pushing the dried hops into bins with a large scoop. After cooling, the dried hops were compressed into rectangular bales, each weighing about 200 pounds. For many years, the majority of growers sold their crops a year or more before harvest to dealers or brokers who advanced money for cultivation and harvest expenses. The dealer took the crop when it was dried and paid the grower any balance due. In 1916, when Oregon's prohibition law took effect, many growers thought that the industry was doomed and they quickly cut production. In 1915, the state had 20,000 acres in hop cultivation and produced 21 million pounds of hops worth over $2 million. By 1918, Oregon had only 8,000 acres in cultivation and produced 3 million pounds of hops worth $700,000. Despite prohibition, both state and national, the industry made a steady comeback between 1918 and 1932. Throughout the 1920s, the hop industry was supported by export and specialty markets, such as near beer and illegal home brew. One minor but interesting market was for hops used as tonics and sold by prescription. These bottles, which belonged to Herman Goshi of Silverton, bore the claim that the contents gave strength and vigor in every drop. Although the onset of the Depression years marked a slight downturn in the market for hops, the repeal of Prohibition in 1933 put new life into the industry. 26,000 acres were planted to hops in 1935. This was an all-time high for the state. The hop fiesta in Independence was a reflection of good times in the industry. Every year between 1934 and the early 1940s, a queen and court were chosen to preside over grand celebrations that included carnivals, parades, and dances. Four factors have combined to change the traditional character of the Oregon hop industry. Downy mildew, mechanization of harvest, a reduction in the amount of hops used in beer, and marketing controls. In the mid-1930s, a fungus disease called downy mildew first appeared in the Willamette Valley hop yards and devastated the crop as no other pest or disease known before. The moderate temperatures and damp weather of the valley were conducive to the spread of the disease and Oregon's otherwise ideal hop growing climate became a liability. James Wynn of Albany tells of using copper sulfate to combat the disease. About 30s, I guess, that this downy mildew, they imported it here from England, mm -hmm. and uh, it, was, it was awful bad. We had a, a small six-acre yard over here across from Mother's there, and uh, I dusted that 20 times. 
spring. We had a good crop on it. We got a good crop out of it. My, get up at four o'clock every morning and dust that. There was that rain. Every time it rained, you had to get out and and there's lime and uh, 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 bluestone. This and copper sulfate is a mixture of that that we had to. That's the only thing that was stopping. While research was conducted to study the disease and possible cures, production in the state of Washington compensated for the shortage of hops from Oregon. Arid country, such as Washington's Yakima Valley, was well suited to hop culture when irrigated, and the dry climate was unfavorable to mildew diseases. Eventually, Researchers discovered that certain varieties of hops were naturally resistant to downy mildew. But by the time the resistant varieties were determined, Washington was firmly entrenched as the leading hop producing state in the nation. Downy mildew is the first of four important factors in the decline of Oregon's hop acreage. The second is mechanization. Mechanization affected many phases of hop culture, from plowing and spraying to drying and baling. But it was the mechanical harvester that made the greatest impact on the industry and reduced the number of people it employed. The search for an efficient mechanical picker goes back to the 19th century. Except for two or three years during the Great Depression, growers were always faced with the problem of obtaining enough pickers to harvest the crop. Mechanical harvesting eliminated the growers' concern about the possible loss of crop due to the shortage of labor. In addition, machines worked more quickly and cleanly than human harvesters. 30 workers in a picking machine did the work that once required 400 people. The cost of running a machine and paying a small crew was considerably less than the expense of hiring hundreds at harvest time and providing accommodations. However, mechanization of harvesting was expensive. The majority of Willamette Valley growers did not have sufficient acreages and hops to justify or finance the initial expense of a picking machine. Herman Goshi tells of the difficulty of finding pickers and the expense of investments. And there just wasn't enough people, so this forced us into mechanization, and this also meant that people had to decide, uh, am I going to continue growing hops? If I am, I'm going to have to mechanize. And a, a stationary machine at that time cost uh, $42,000, and that was a lot of money in, in the 1940s. Uh, so uh, they had to have sufficient acreage to, uh, to warrant this investment and uh, the other things that went with it. In the late 1940s, there were over 1,000 hop growers in Oregon. By 1952, there were less than 400. In the same period, hop acreage dropped from 18,000 acres to 6,000 acres. The expense of mechanization was partially responsible. A third important factor in the reduction of Oregon's hop acreage was the amount of hops used to flavor beer, a process known as hopping. Beer and ales were once much stronger in hop taste than they are at present. At one time, 12 ounces of dried hops were used to flavor each barrel of beer. The hopping rate was gradually reduced until only 3 ounces of hops were used to flavor a barrel of beer. The 75% reduction in the ratio of hops to beer greatly decreased the demand for dried hops. Federal marketing controls are a fourth factor in the shrinking of Oregon's hop acreage. The hop market has traditionally been very erratic. 
The market price of hops has fluctuated as much as 400% from one year to the next. The purpose of federal controls was to stabilize the market by balancing supply with demand. Controls were first instituted in 1938 to limit the quantity of hops marketed. Each year, industry representatives would estimate hop production and compare it with anticipated demand. A standard saleable percentage was then determined just before harvest. Because of the late determination, growers were unable to adjust by planting less acreage. The loss of 10 to 30 percent of a crop in this way forced a number of growers out of the hop industry. Later, saleable percentages were eliminated. In the 1960s, federal regulations were revised and base quotas were assigned to individual growers. The assigned base system offered a measure of protection to those who were able and willing to invest heavily in expensive modern machinery and trellis systems. In turn, the increased stability of the market has helped create a small but thriving multi-million dollar hop industry in the Willamette Valley. With approximately 5,000 acres in production, Oregon today grows 17% of the total U.S. hop crop, even though downy mildew, mechanization, hopping rates, and market controls have combined to change the character of the industry. Most of the growers who left the hop business turned to more stable crops. Most of the workers who once helped harvest hops turned to steadier and better paying jobs. For most people, the transition was uneventful. But the memory of the old days lingers, and the aging kilns that may still be seen near the traditional centers of hop production are nostalgic reminders of the industry as it once was, when the fields were bursting with life and cries of the workday filled the air. 